The summer movies are upon us. First out, Crimson Tide. It is a story of a mutiny aboard a nuclear submarine. It stars Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman. The producers, Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer, rose to fame in the 1980s with box office hits like Flashdance, Beverly Hills Cop, Beverly Hills Cop 2, and Top Gun. While they may have lost some of their luster over the last few years, their latest film, Crimson Tide, is already receiving quite a bit of attention as the characters move from Cold War certainty to post-Cold War questions. Joining me now, Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer. Welcome. Thank you it's very much. It's a pleasure to meet both of you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, tell me uh, what you and how this film came into being. I mean, it is not based on a Tom Clancy novel. It is not based on uh, an original work by someone else. Somebody had a good idea and said, let's make a movie. Who was it? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's kind of, we're, we're, I guess, a product of our culture. Yeah. And we are avid readers and avid watchers of, of television and, and go to movies a lot. You know, things kind of breathe to you and tell you yeah. what's, what's happening in the world. I mean, Top Gun came from a magazine article that we both read. And so yeah. this, is, this is a great, great movie. The story I mean, of this it, it's an arena. Is extraordinary. Yeah. It's an arena. Both of us had, uh, were sent a documentary uh, that was done about a nuclear submarine. And, you know, as we watched it, we said, This was what? on the Discovery Channel, is that right? Yes, yeah, that's They did right. that whole thing inside of... Yeah. That's right. And so we watched this, uh, this documentary and said, what a great place for drama. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's all there. It's, it's the sweating and the closeness and the fact that you have Zirinovsky out in the world uh, yeah. carrying on in Russia. And we said, you know, there hasn't been real, a real Cold War threat since, I guess, the 50s and 60s. Uh, and let's, since nobody else is doing it, we're going to do it. Yeah. You know, when we made Top Gun, everybody said nobody's going to want to watch a fighter pilot move. They yeah. haven't done those in, in, since the 40s. Uh, and we always look at things that way. Whatever anybody else is doing, we're doing something else. And so what do you do next? You say, this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. you know, do you then go commission a script? Well, Pretty much. Yeah, <clears throat> there are a number of ways to approach it, but the way Jerry and I have always worked is uh, we look around for the venue, we look around mm -hmm. for the notion, the central spark, and we have a tendency to work on it ourselves. You know, what's, what's the fundamental shape going to be? What's the point of view? What's the direction? And it's important for us to be able to embrace the thematic factors, the emotionality factors, and be able to say, ah, we have a real strong point of view about the tale we want to tell. Sometimes we'll take it further than we did in this movie, but in this, in this movie's case, we had the venue, and we had the direction, and then you look for a writer. Yeah. And, you know, we found a man named... Oh, you look for many writers. <laughs> and sometimes you look for writer after writer after writer. Yes, yes. we do. And sometimes and we rewrite and, and rewrite sometimes and you hire the writer, <laughs> and you hire another writer, another writer, another writer. Which is our case <laughs> here, is it? Well, the truth of the matter is, yes and no. Michael Schiffer, the man who gets screenplay credit, deserves yeah. the screenplay credit right. he got. He did uh, yeoman-like work and provided the blueprint for this picture. It's also true that there were a couple or three or four other writers yeah. involved who came in and provided flourishes, provided yeah. colors, uh, added to the palette. People like Oscar-winning Quentin Tarantino. Or yes, yes, and Oscar-winning Robert Town. Yes. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, Steve Zalian, another Steve Oscar, Zalian, yeah. another Oscar yeah. winner. <laughs> it's actually kind of interesting, the fact that we yeah. have two Oscar-winning actors and three Oscar-winning screenwriters. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the secrets that Jerry and I uh, have found to be very valuable is if you want to look smart, hire incredibly smart yeah. people. <laughs> yes. So that's kind of what we do. That's kind of the key to our success. If you surround yourself with, 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 with really smart. brilliant people, they make you okay. look I want to talk about the partnership later, but let me get to this film. So then you decide we need two. We've got two protagonists here. Mm -hmm. You look at your screenplay that mm -hmm. finally is in front of you. Mm -hmm. And it, it demands great performance because all the action essentially takes place inside mm -hmm. a contained place, a submarine. Well, it happened early on. Uh, Michael Schiffer, who, who was writing the screenplay and did an enormous amount of work and, yeah. and killed himself, did all the research and, and wrote a terrific screenplay, he said, you know, when I was writing, we had one of our meetings, and so when I was writing the script, he said, I always saw Gene Hackman as yeah. playing the lead role. Ooh, what an interesting idea. So conceptually, we're, Gene Hackman's always there in the back of our heads as, yeah. we're, as we're going through the layers of casting. He's Ramsey in your head. I, exactly. And so no matter who we went to, or not who we went to, or who got interested in the script, there was always Gene Hackman. Yeah. Now, Gene Hackman's an actor who, who works a lot, yet he doesn't want to work a lot. Mm -hmm. So you never know if you can get him to go back to work. We knew he just finished a picture, and we weren't sure we can get him to come to the table again. So you got to play a few games. So what games do you play? Well, you start with his agent right away. You call his agent up <laughs> and say, look, we got a screenplay here that we know Gene would be terrific for. We know yeah. he's working on a picture right now, and I know Gene that he, yeah. you know, he doesn't want to get up and, and go do it again. He's got a beautiful young bride, and, 
and he's got a, a place in New Mexico, and he's a painter, so I know he likes to, needs time off and likes time off. And we start that way. We talk to the agent, and we say, we have this wonderful screenplay, yeah. please read it. And he calls us back. He'd already read it. Right. And he said, Gene's great for it. Gene's yeah. got to do this movie. Yeah. So already we knew that Gene Hackman's agent wanted him to do the picture. Uh, you know, we dabbled with Warren Beatty for a while. Yeah, I know. I only know that because there was a story about you and all the video equipment you have at your house, right. and you right. mentioned having Beatty over and said, ah, Beatty was under the consideration here. No, yeah, Warren had read the script very yeah. early on when it first came out and said, this is a great, great role and a, and a terrific movie. Yeah. And we met with him, and he said, I have these script concerns. We bring our writer in, Michael Schiffer, and we sit down, and we have these long meetings over about a three-week period. Yeah. And he improved the screenplay enormously. He did. Oh, Beatty. absolutely. absolutely. Good he asked all the smart... Smart yeah. question. Warren uh, served a particular function. He was the equivalent of uh, of the Star Court Chamber, yeah. as if we were in the chamber and, and he was there cross examining us. And what he was doing, from a very very positive position and point of view, was saying, on a daily basis, and this went on for about a month. I want to do this movie, but, and it was the but factor that kept precipitating us to escalate, escalate. Yeah. Well, then we, we we've got to address these issues. And in all fairness, not that we wouldn't have. But he, he compelled us to do it very immediately. And frankly, Warren never said no. What was interesting about the whole process was he, he went to the dance. He just didn't want to go home with us. Yeah. And it was, he said, I, I'm not saying no. Yeah. I'm just not saying totally yes. So this he, is one of his flaws, though, don't you think? Well, no, I think he, it's one of the ways that he works. Okay. I, I wouldn't better. consider it a flaw. Well, I mean, <laughs> and you, Warren, look at, you, you, you look at his... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You look at his body of work, and most of the stuff that Warren has done is really stuff he's conceived and, and done himself and, and produced himself. So yeah. it wasn't unusual. I mean, look at every actor who wants to be in, terrific, in a terrific film and always looking for good okay, screenplays. So you, you get Hackman, who finally says, okay. All right. Yeah. Now, now, does Hackman know that Washington is under consideration? I think Washington was at the dance before Gene. Oh, really? So, the, yeah. th and, that, and there's a reason for that. Yeah. <clears throat> what happened is, given that the role Denzel played is the younger character, the list was in some way shorter. Uh, it, it was not a very long list for a guy who could who have that kind of uh, acting firepower, not movie star power, but in, because it, it's a cerebral role to play. And Denzel was always right in there. He was right in there in the, in the pantheon, the all-star equation. And when we've been talking about Gene, and then also I said, well, gee whiz, okay, Gene, Denzel becomes an automatic for the following reason. We started to look at this movie like the equivalent of the Thrilla in Manila, the Rumble in the Jungle. It was like <laughs> Ali Frazier. Because when you're going to do two hours in an enclosed space, yeah. toe to toe, boom, yeah, boom, right, boom, right. let me Macho. Got to mano, be, mano. you got to be the kind of individual who can keep cranking it up. Yeah. And let me tell you, when you see the picture, when we see the picture now, not to be disingenuous, Jerry and I have more than once looked at each other and say, who else could have played these two roles yeah. when you see them in combination? Now, Brad Pitt was under consideration for he, the we, we talk, role. We talked to him. We yeah. talked to him. We talked to Val Kilmer. Um, Al Pacino. We talked Pacino? To, well, Pacino for, for, the, for, older, for the older role. Older, oh, yeah. And, and, and was, was Cruz under consideration at all? Or is he too... He was busy. He was busy. He was so busy. you couldn't get him. Yeah, he was would, busy. Would you have thought of him because of Top Gun? Or? Well, we would have thought of Tom because he's a... Believe me, he's a really, really terrific actor. Yeah. And it, it's not just his star power. And we've worked with him so much. The right. answer is yes. Al Pacino came into play because when we were searching around and we were looking for that cerebral actor, Al yeah. was available. So Jerry and I spent time sitting with him, talking with him about the movie. And he was a fascinating individual in that he was so thoughtful about it. And he sat there and he was so polite. We spent about a week. He, I lived next door to the Bel Air Hotel and he'd be over there. That's the piece you read about the machinery and stuff. He'd come over and he, uh, and he had nothing but fascinating questions to ask about the character. And then he wanted to meet with Quentin, which yeah. he did. A number, then, a number of times. A number of times. And then... He was writing the screenplay at that point. Quentin no, was, he, hadn't, he was... Uh, oh. The next pass was going to be Quentin. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but he wanted yeah. to hear his point and of view. And Tony Scott, the director, is in. Yes. He's there. He's Absolutely. There from Absolutely. day one. And he brought Quentin in. Right. Mm -hmm. He said, if I'm going to make this movie, I want Quentin to do the rewrite. Right. He did True Romance with him. Yeah. And we were sufficiently close to getting Al that on a weekend, his agent spoke to us and said, you know... Boy, Al's not saying no. As a matter of fact, I think you guys are going to get him. He says, but he wants, he just wants a little utzing as far as the script. So Jerry and Robert Town got on a plane. I, I was, I was working on Bad Boys at the time. They got on a plane and flew to New York to sit for like two days with Al to do anything possible to get him. Now, is this true in most movies? You've got to go through, you as a producer, let's assume you've got your director, mm -hmm. have got to go through this real cell job. 
Always. To bring together the people you think are going to make Always, the movie you yes. want to make. Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, yeah. imagine, imagine if you are one of these individuals, male or female, it's going to be your face, your personality, your emotions up there for two hours. And right. In front of the world. And your career. Right. And if, you, if you've made the wrong choice in terms of the people, the material, yeah. forget about it. I mean, it, it's scary. All right, here are some of the reservations that some of the critics have pointed out. I mean, it's gotten these good reviews we talked about. But some people say, look, I mean, there is n the worst violence you have is a couple of slaps. That's it, you know? And the only one person is killed, and that happens in a little fire, a reaction to a fire. It's a heart attack, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got all this contained thing. And Ramsey, there's not, it's not evil versus good. It really is generational. It's about attitude. It's about shaping influences. It's about two people really engaged in a battle of will and mm -hmm. ideas and experience. Are well, you worried that this is not going to be exciting? This is not going to be? Yes. I mean, initially when we first made the movie, we said, oh my God, there's yeah. no real villain in this. Right. There's action, but there's not a lot of action. Right. It's just great acting, great characters. And it's kind of a suspense character thriller yeah. until we showed it to an audience. And they said what? They said, this is one of the best movies yeah. I've seen in a while. Uh, it's the highest score we've ever gotten in any of our pictures, and we've had some very big movies. Right. So we said, now, wait a second. We might have something here. And I think what we, what we found out is when people got up during the movie and had to go to the, to the bathroom or whatever, they were always looking at the screen and walking backwards. Right. And you hit a certain point in the movie, and nobody leaves their seat. So the suspense is heightened to such a level that you don't want to leave and you can't move. Okay. Let me set this where we are now. We, we've got Crimson Tide made, uh, and, and this is the movie that we're going to take a look at, uh, produced by Don and Jerry. Here is the film with Hackman and with Denzel. They're on a nuclear submarine, and just the basic plot is that there is a Washington sends down an order to send nuclear missiles from this submarine to attack some renegades in Russia, a character similar to uh, Zirinovsky, a kind of nationalist who has seized control of some nuclear weapons. And then the senior officer, Kent Ramsey, has made a decision to do it. Then there is a garble message that comes. And one side says, we wait until we know. The other side says, we got to go because we've got one message. And that's the way that I see the rules. And so you then have a, and, and on the nuclear submarine, at that time, at that time, you had to have both people sign on before you could send the missiles because mm -hmm. what was a line from Hackman, from Ramsey, about this is the biggest, most, what, what's the line about how- Most lethal killing machine. Most lethal killing machine. Ever devised by man. Right. So you now have a contest of wills between these two people. Roll tape, here it is. It requires my assent, I do not give it. And furthermore, you continue upon this course and insist upon this launch without confirming this message Stop. first, I will be Chief of the boat. Back by the rules of precedent, Captain, the commanding officer of the USS Alabama. I order you. Eight, one, to five, place the XO two, under arrest on the charge of the Navy regulations. I say you again. I order you to place the XO under arrest on the charge of mutiny. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> You've seen this a hundred times. What I'm doing is getting engaged by the movie, which is the reason Jerry and I do what we do for a living. We love movies, and yeah. I can't help it. It doesn't matter that we were there. It doesn't matter that we were there before it was done. I love watching world-class people do their job. Did you go to Hollywood to be an actor? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, I trained to be an actor, uh, and uh, I then became, I was a screenwriter, and, and, yeah. I, and I wrote a couple of things. You had a production of Paramount or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, does he want to be in these films at all? <laughs> sure, he'd love to be in these films. <laughs> I mean, he's dying to be in them. And you're the guy that says no. <laughs> Hold him back. No. Says, you can't do that. You're making this movie. <laughs> Tell me about the acting. I mean, in a sense, what, what's fascinating about this, I mean, if you, what's going to be the appeal, I think, is you got two, more than two. There was a guy, the third guy's named George, uh, George DeSunda, who, who used to be one of the stars of Law and Order. Right, right. Runs here. And he's a powerful, I mean, mm -hmm. a very good actor. Was he in Basic Instinct as well? Was yes. He yes, That's he, what was. I thought. he was. Absolutely. He was in that too. So you've got these two powerful mm -hmm. actors. What are you seeing there? And I mean, do they just bring that to the table, all of the stuff that makes good acting, good film acting in terms of face, in terms of expression, in terms of, of ratcheting it up, all that kind of stuff? I mean, does that come... Well, you know, it's the level. You got Gene Hackman, who's one of the premier actors in the business, let's face it. And then you got Denzel, who's a young kid on the block, the Turk, who's already won an Academy Award and is brilliant at what he does. And you just watch how, how they work against each other, where you see where, where Gene starts to modulate and go really high and, and gets his energy up. And Denzel is so smart because he plays right under him. He 
and keeps it real calm and real yeah. quiet. And then when Gene calms down, then Denzel raises up. Yeah. And it's like an opera to, to watch these guys work. Uh, it's like singing these arias. And how many takes for that scene? You, were you there? Yes. Mm -hmm. it, I, I would say it was five or six takes. It wasn't yeah. a lot. And each one different, or ratcheting up, or? Uh, it, they, work up to, they work up to a level. In other words, yeah. they kind of, we do a couple of rehearsals where they kind of walk through yeah. it. And then the first take is at a certain level. The second take starts to really take shape. By the third take, they're there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really interesting, especially in, as concerns these two individuals. There was a moment in time during the latter part of the shooting where sort of off screen, off stage, Denzel made an offhand comment about Gene because they'd come out of, it was really the Lippins on her horse speech the latter oh, part of the movie. Right, yeah. He just turned around and he said, that man can flat act. Yeah. And Gene Hackman says, just like you. <laughs> Boom. You'd think it was a, a part of a movie, just the fact yeah. that they were making can these Can you references. tell, I, mean, I assume you can, when it's happening, whether you got something going, whether you got the right kind of chemistry, yes. whether yeah. the oh, character. You, yes. You know, you it's can, palpable. If you don't have it, you can feel it and you, and you begin to sweat. Absolutely. And, yeah. and you can also, you, you can tell if you have a successful picture. Yeah. You can tell if, if the picture's working for you and then the characters have a certain charisma. But, you know, also, uh, you know, Gene and Denzel are so smart. What they do is they, they, they kind of gauge by what the director's doing, and they can tell when the director is going to say six or seven takes, or he's going to go ten or twelve, so they save themselves. They watch how a director works. Some directors will do three takes, so they yeah. the third take better be the best. Tony's a five, six take guy, so they mm -hmm. kind of build to the fifth or sixth take, and then they give it to you. Days of Thunder mm -hmm. uh, made money, made about twenty million. I read for the two of you. Uh, did it, but it didn't do what some people expected it to do. Mm -hmm. How would you do it differently today? Do you know? <laughs> well. The problem in, was a problem of perception. It was Jerry and I coming off Top Gun and Jerry and I and Tom Cruise coming off Top Gun. At that point in time, it was the number one picture in the world. The picture had made almost $500 million. And there was such uh, an enormity of expectation brought to the party. The picture was expensive because you had these $100,000 cars going around the track at 150 yeah. miles an hour, wrecking it. The answer is, you have to understand what you're dealing with going into a picture like that. And what happened was, is the audience, and this is a line that comes from Robert Town. When Ro we asked Robert Town to write the picture, he said, yes. And he jumped on board. And he said, I have a slight misgiving. We said, what's that? He said, you know, my wife said to me, why does anybody want to watch a picture where a bunch of men are chasing themselves around in a circle? <laughs> well, I suppose that's the answer to your question. I mean, as brilliant as Tom was, and as much fun as we had making the picture, ultimately an audience for a couple of hours, says it's not like watching ESPN. And in the end, why do you think this picture works for those that it work, works for? You know, it's, it's, it's in the storytelling. It's always in the storytelling. If you tell them a great tale with great characters, you yeah, got that's it. what it is. And you know, it, or somebody once said, the great drama is characters that you like in conflict. You got yeah. it. You know, and that's what you have here. What's the way you two work? I mean, wh where is the, where is the, you know, chemistry between the two of you. Who does what? Well, you know, in the beginning, you know, Don uh, came from a screenwriting background and a performing background uh, and also was a studio executive. He was a head of Paramount uh, for like five or six years. He was president of production. So he had uh, the showmanship qualities. He also has the, uh, the literary background of storytelling. And then he had the management expertise of knowing how a studio thinks. I was always on the outside of the system. I was always the one actually making the pictures. I was on the line, uh, you know, getting them up to speed, uh, getting them made, and then marketing and promoting them and editing them. So we kind of came from two different, I have a photographic background. I was a kid, I was a photographer, right. and I still dabble in it. So I had the visual and understanding of how to make movies. Don had the other expertise. So through the years we've been working together, we're interchangeable now. I've learned a lot about what he does, other than the showmanship. And he's learned a lot about, uh, what, about the actual making of the movies. So right now it's like a hockey analogy would be Messier and Adam Graves going yeah. uh, attacking the net and passing back and forth, and the one who has the best shot takes it, and that's basically yeah. what we do now. Are you uh, when you came out of the '80s? I mentioned there was a little lull. There was about mm -hmm. five years where you had no hits. Did you think I've lost the touch? Whatever we had, we don't have. Or was it simply the machinations of studios in Los Angeles where you know you're not at the right place and you can't get it done for whatever reason? It was, it was, without being disingenuous or evasive, it was the latter. Um, it, 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 it's not a question of arrogance or overweening self-confidence. 
Jerry and I, because we have such respect for one another and faith in one another, we knew that we knew how to do it. But we needed to get our development slate to a place where we could get pictures that we really wanted to make. And as a function of the uh, the transfer from Paramount to Disney and a number of other things, it was... Well, you left Paramount after... Yes, after Days of Thunder. Days of Thunder. Yes, and then we went to Disney. Yeah, on your own, or they said, uh, let's just It was a mutual this. parting of the yeah, ways. It was, like a, it was like a divorce. Both sides said, uh, let's not stay in this bed much longer, like yeah. another day. Mm -hmm. So we left and went to Disney. And, and, there, and, and you're there with... Katzenberg. Yeah, mm -hmm. Jeff and Michael both. I mean, right. since I used to work for Michael and Jeff used to work for me, et right. cetera, et cetera, and we'd had great Michael used to run it. Paramount. Indeed mm -hmm. he did. Yeah. So, so you go to Paramount and it doesn't, I mm -hmm. mean, you leave Paramount and you go to Disney. What's right. the problem there? It's no problem. It's, it's just the fact of, of getting the right writers on the right projects and getting them up to speed quick enough. And we just didn't get up to speed quick enough. No movie stepped out and said, hey, I got to be made. Now, could you guys, I don't understand this, what I read somewhere, you could have had disclosure. Listen, it was available to us, there's no doubt yeah. about it. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a different management philosophy at Disney. It was a kind of management philosophy that we had at Paramount, where you create your hits. You yeah. know? In other words, you don't go out and spend a, a ton of money uh, buying movies. You develop them like we did it when we were at Paramount. It's, so, it, to use a sports analogy, yeah. it's like going into a system, and we play a particular kind of offense, yeah. and at that point in time, and... Jeff was totally straightforward and honest mm -hmm. about it in this, this day. Jeff was playing a defensive game. We were mm -hmm. playing an offensive game. And there wasn't necessarily a meeting of the minds. And all of a sudden, where the meeting of the minds occurred was Crimson Tide. Jeff Katzenberg committed to Crimson Tide before mm -hmm. he left. Mm -hmm. He's the guy who... And it comes out of Hollywood Pictures, so it's... Darn yeah, right. right. Yes. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, what, what, how do you build your team? Through your farm system, or, or do you buy the real expensive players? They were building the team through the farm system. And it took us time to get our farm system where we had some great players in the farm system. And that's what happened when we got Bad Boys and, and, and Dangerous Minds and Crimson Tide came out Bad of the farm Boys going to be okay? Oh, yeah. It's, it's the biggest opening of the year so far. It's uh, 13 million or something. It was 15 95, and a 15. half. And uh, it's, already, short change. <laughs> it's already at uh, 55. All right, now tell me about Bad Boys. I haven't yeah. seen it. Bad Boys, here's, here's the simple analogy. Bad Boys is the reason we go to movies. Crimson Tide is the reason we make movies. Bad Boys is an <laughs> e-ticket popcorn entertainment ride. Yeah. What's wonderful about it is the camera. This is a couple of... of, of oh, you, the, 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 the simple tale is, is it, it's two guys um, who are cops, and they're narcotics cops, and they're totally different in their lifestyles. One's happily married, has four kids, a wonderful mm -hmm. wife, et cetera. And Sounds uh, like a formula to me. And, well, <laughs> it, is, it is certainly observable on that level, yes. <laughs> Roll tape. Here's Bad Boys, and we'll have a few more minutes of conversation before we go. Here it is. That's Bad Boys has made how much? Thirteen. It opened at fifteen and a half. It's already at fifty-five. And Crimson million. Tide is did what first weekend? It, it, we it hasn't. Yet. Oh, it hasn't opened yet. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it opens this weekend. We're yes, ahead. Right. It opens on Friday. Harvey Weinstein at Merrimack said to me that you know by Friday night at twelve o'clock whether you've got a hit. You're right. He's is that right. right? Well, you know what level your pictures. What are you looking at? at? Like, what does he well, know? Or no, yeah. no. Harvey's a very smart man. Um, the truth of the matter is you don't really know if you've got a blockbuster until the third weekend. Okay. That's when you really know. But, but you know if your picture opens. Curiosity is by yeah. that time. Exactly. Yeah. You know whether the word of mouth is going to kill it. Uh, what is this movie that, that Kevin Costner's in? Is it called Waterworld? Water Water World. World. How much is it up to? What's the speculation? It's, we leave that to you and the media. <laughs> when we, we don't talk know. about this? Well, no. no we'll we'll we we have no idea what it costs. Uh, see, we were in the same dance with Days of Thunder where people were speculating what, what, oh, the, picture, oh, what the picture costs, and they were all wrong. So, yeah. you know, it's up to the people at, at, at MCA to tell you what the picture if really costs. If it's 175, it's 175 million. That's a lot of money to it's recoup, money. isn't it? It's a lot of money. But when you go walk into a picture like that, it has innate problems. Here's what I'm asking. Um, Eddie Murphy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beverly Hill Cop 1, Beverly Hill Cop 2, Beverly Hill Cop 3 didn't work. Where is Eddie Murphy's career now? I mean, I, we all should be Eddie Murphy. He's got a ton of money and he's got mm -hmm. a lot of talent. But what does a couple of bad movies do for you? What does well, he have it, to do? It does create a perception in the audience that for some reason you're making choices that they no longer embrace. Right. But you know something when you're, as, when you're and this is not to, to kiss anybody's butt, when you're as talented as Eddie Murphy is, yeah. all he has to do is make one right choice again. Oh, Samson wants you to work for him, Murphy. Yeah. All right. Now, and what about Costner? I mean, Costner's... 
Does he Listen, have some when, riding on this movie doing well? Well, sure. Every, every actor, uh, when they open a picture, has a lot riding. Yeah. Because you, you, your fee is based on what the opening weekend is. So you have to draw, uh, you know, a large audience to justify the fee that we pay you. So he's got a lot riding. Yeah. Just like, you know, uh, Tom Cruise or Arnold Schwarzenegger or anybody. Yeah. And you guys have something weekend. riding on Crimson Tide. I mean, you're... Yes, sir. Sure. on the table. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Here's what's interesting about it. I thought what Hackman and Denzel Washington said, they both said it's like a play in part. Now, I know in ways that you, you want to cringe at that because you got Tony Scott doing all this fancy stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and the lights and the motion and dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it is because of the drama of the inter-reaction between the two characters. We love that. It's like Craft Playhouse in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when you got ready to make this, did you watch Kane Mutiny? Did you watch Run Silent, Run Deep? Did you watch Mutiny on the Bounded? Did you das watch... Boot. Yeah. Got Das Boot, yeah, sure. that was a good one. And the other one with uh, Sean Connery, what was that? Uh, Hunt, Red, Hunt, Hunt for Red, 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 Red October. Sure. You watched all of them. Every one of them. Yeah. It's research. You know, I mean, you got to look what other people did to And can you now yourself. say that when, when the audience is millions of people that watch this program go to buy a ticket for Crimson Tide, can you say to them, I've given you the best I can do. This is it. I don't think we or ever... Or would you say, well, if I'd had another month or two, I would have really been able to make a hell of a movie. Not, yeah, not I always want to change what we've done, you know, but this is a terrific picture. You always want to change it. I mean, it's, always, yeah, it's like you an always, You always it's like do better. Interview. You walk exactly. out and say, why'd I ask that? If I maybe you got it may have been a bigger, bigger payoff, and I bet sure. I asked this. Good luck. Thank you. Great to have Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Great to meet you. Stay with us.